have the pleasure of um, being the person to introduce R.T. Kendall tonight. R.T. Kendall earned his Master of Divinity from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and his Doctor of Philosophy from Oxford University. He was the minister of Westminster Chapel in London for 25 years. R.T. has authored more than 60 books, which display his gifting as both teacher and prophet. With titles as diverse as God Meant It for Good, A Fresh Look at the Life of Joseph, Holy Fire, Amen, <laughs> Sensitivity of the Spirit, Learning to Stay in the Flow of God's Direction, and Total Forgiveness. His next book, to be released later this year, promises to rock the boat of today's Christian church. It's his next book, this, this book is entitled, Whatever Happened to the Gospel? R.T. has had a keen interest and expertise in revival history. And my wife and I head up First Love Works, a ministry that promotes revival in New England. We first invited R.T. to speak at our Revival Then and Now conference in 2011, which celebrated George Whitfield's contribution to revival in New England and looked to God to revive us today. R.T. was our keynote speaker in 2012 when we again hosted Revival Then and Now, that time honoring Jonathan Edwards' place in revival history. We then had the pleasure of meeting Louise, R.T.'s wife, who we found has a tremendous sense of grace and humor. Louise, would you stand so we could just acknowledge you? <laughs> At the end of that conference in 2012, R.T. turned to us and asked, so when are you going to do Moody? He's one of my favorites. <laughs> R.T., that question stuck with us for years. And after the Restore Conference here last year and the reopening of the campus by the Moody Center, we talked with Jonathan Frizz and New England Alliance and together decided to put on this conference, Restore and Revive. Your question about Moody provided the impetus for this event. <clears throat> we thank you and we look forward to the rich feast that you will serve us tonight from God's word and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that you bring. Let's all rise and give a warm welcome to R.T. Kendall. Please. With an introduction like that, I don't know what you're expecting. <laughs> Actually, Tom, the way you introduced me reminds me of a friend of mine from Pennsylvania. He was introduced to this large sales gathering as the man from Texas who had made $200 million in oil. And he was going to tell how he did it. Well, when he heard the introduction, he panicked. He thought, oh dear, what am I going to do? Well, he said to himself, there's only one thing to do, and that's to stand up and tell these people the truth. He said, folks, before I get into my talk, uh, there are one or two discrepancies in this man's introduction to me. First of all, I'm not from Texas. I'm from Pennsylvania. Second, the money was not in oil. It was in coal. And third, the money was not $200 million. It was $200,000. Fourth, it wasn't me, it was my brother. <laughs> Fifth, he didn't make it, he lost it. <laughs> well, this is the third time I've been invited to be with you, and I'm honored. Thank you, Tom, Anne, and I uh, pray that this will be a, 
a blessed time. Um, you, you kindly mentioned my books. What you didn't say, we're trying to get rid of them. Everything is $10. They're supposed to be 15, 16, 17, 10. Easy to remember. And if there's any left over, we'll ship them to Nashua, uh, New Hampshire, where I will be in a couple of weeks. But it's a delight to be with you. I am not preaching, but I did feel I should read two verses, actually from Romans. In the light of the fact that I'm going to talk a bit about D.L. Moody. This is the most appropriate verse I can imagine. Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And then Romans 15 verse 20, where Paul said, it has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. Well, may God be pleased to bless the reading and that we can do what is right to honor D.L. Moody and bring honor and glory to God. A brief word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray now for the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus by your Spirit to fall upon every mind in this place in order that their perception of what is said will be heard as you intend. And cleanse my tongue that I will be your transparent instrument to say what needs to be said, nothing that doesn't need to be said. I pray that we'll give due honor to D.L. Moody, but the great honor to our Lord Jesus Christ, and that you will put your seal upon this word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Jonathan Edwards taught us that the task of every generation is to discover in which direction the sovereign redeemer is moving, then move in that direction. By implication, it goes to show that God does not work exactly the same way in every generation. Uh, I frequently go to Wales, a part of the uh, United Kingdom, and they're still talking about the Welsh revival that took place in 1904. Uh, no one is alive of course, uh, but uh, there are a lot of people that were alive to talk to people who had seen it. I myself uh, used to spend hours with Mrs. Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, who was in it. And, uh, but the thing is, the people in South Wales tend to think that if revival comes, we will know it. But they assume that that's the way it will be. Take, for example, what happened in the 16th century. Uh, Martin Luther, John Calvin, the Reformers. The world was turned upside down. By the way, the book, Whatever Happened to the Gospel, is to commemorate the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther nailing the 95 Theses on the door of Wittenberg, Whatever Happened to the Gospel. But the thing is, God was at work in the 16th century. He was at work in the 18th century through the preaching of Whitfield, Wesley, Jonathan Edwards. But there's little resemblance between the two except a common denominator of theological soundness and stability. Under the preaching of Jonathan Edwards, when he preached that sermon, Sin is in the Hands of an Angry God, in Enfield, Connecticut, God honored that with such power, the fear of God came upon the place. And people were holding on to pews to keep from sliding into hell. They were holding on to tree trunks outside to keep from sliding into hell. God only did it once. He preached the same sermon two weeks later, no effect at all. Just to show that God decided once 
to give the people of New England a taste of the wrath and fear of God. It is America's great awakening. What you may not know is there was a second great awakening. It took place in my home state of Kentucky, in Bourbon County, in an area known as Cane Ridge. It was the beginning of the camp meeting phenomenon. People came in their covered wagons for, from seven states for fellowship and Bible study. One Sunday morning in July 1801, a Methodist lay preacher stood on the, on the top of a fallen tree, took his text from 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of the things done in the body, whether they be good or bad. As he preached, people began to fall to the ground under the power of God. There's no way to know exactly what that was like. It's just a case of reading reports and of eyewitnesses. But the implication was that it was not dissimilar to what happened in Edward's day, except that they just fell. A sense of awe of standing before the judgment seat of Christ. But when you come to D.L. Moody, God used him, but it was very different from the manifestations that you had in Edward's day or Cane Ridge Revival. Deep emotion were present under Edwards on that day, July 8th, 1741. And in 1801, in the Cane Ridge Revival. But as far as we're able to tell, it was altogether different under D.L. Moody, where emotion was pretty much detached. Doesn't mean there wasn't any emotion. And I will refer to D.L. Moody's own baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, which was emotional. But his ministry was not that. There would be those who say, well, that's not of God if there's not a sense of manifestation. You'd be like the people in Wales that think that revival is going to be like it happened then. Take Hebrews chapter 11. All those people did what they did by faith. Not one of them got to repeat what was done before. Enoch walked with God. He was taken to heaven. Abraham walked with God. He thinks, oh, maybe I'll be taken to heaven. No, he went out not knowing where he was going. Noah walked with God. Oh, maybe I'll be taken to heaven. No, you build an ark. And it was never repeated. And we must remember that the way God may choose to manifest himself in our day may have no precedent. And that's where the stigma is. Because the critics of revival always say, oh, show us where this has happened before. Or show it here or there. And so the question is, are we willing for God to show up in a way that is unprecedented? Because what happened under D.L. Moody was unprecedented. Dwight Lehman Moody was born February 5th, 1837 in Northfield, Massachusetts. He was only 62 years old when he died. And I just saw at a distance his burial place, his grave next to his wife just a few hundred feet from where we stand. He preached the gospel to more than 100 million people. His motto was, this one thing I do. And that referred to soul winning. I wonder if I'm gonna make you a little bit uncomfortable tonight. Because if we give an invitation at the end, are you willing to be a soul winner? When I first came to Westminster Chapel, 
just a month or two after I'd been there, I asked the question, how many of you members out here at Westminster Chapel have never led a soul to Jesus Christ? It got very quiet. And one of the men there, his name was Bob George. He said, I was shaken when you said that. I said to myself, here I am, 60 years old, and I've never led a person to Jesus. I'm going to ask you. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I'm not going to embarrass you. But I'm going to ask you, is it possible that you have never led a soul to Jesus Christ? You say, well, R.T., I witness by my life. Well, I can imagine when Jonah marches into Nineveh, he says, I'm just going to witness by my life. <laughs> See what happens. No, he had a message. Forty days, Nineveh will be overthrown. And you don't really get many people saved, as you might hope, just because you witness with your life. In fact, there was a lady in California who had the view that she would only witness with her life. She wasn't going to bother people, talk to them about Jesus, witness with her life. And one day, after being at the job for several years, a person came up to her and said, you know, I've been watching you. You're different. You are different. What is it? And so this lady is going, mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And the question came, are you a vegetarian? <laughs> D.L. Moody was born into abject poverty. His father was a brick mason, died when Moody was only four years old. When he was 17, he moved to Boston to work in his uncle's shoe store on the condition that he would attend the Congregational Church of Mount Vernon. Moody was converted when he was 19, but in his first application for church membership, he was rejected, but accepted a year later. The man who led him to the Lord said, and I quote, Seldom have I seen a person more unlikely to become, become a Christian of clear and undecided views of gospel truth, still less to fill any extended sphere of public usefulness. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it, how we underestimate a person I preach sometimes in Memphis, and in the Assembly of God church there, uh, there's a story that they don't like to hear, that Elvis Presley tried out for the choir and was re rejected because they said, you don't have a good voice. <laughs> D.L. Moody was converted in a shoe store when his Sunday school teacher, Edward Kimball, told him how much God loved him. Now, here's a contrast right here. Look at the words of Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Edwards actually said, God abhors you and hates you with a hatred. You are more venomous in his eyes than a poisonous snake is in our eyes. Well, you could take that and say, well, that's the only way God works. But what converted D. O. Moody was this man, Edward Kimball, who said God loved him. What I'm trying to get over here is that God doesn't always use the same exact words for everybody. And we must keep that in mind. And it was Edwards himself who taught us that the task of every generation 
is to discover in which direction the sovereign redeemer is moving, then moving and then move in that direction. D.O. Moody later said, I don't remember what Kimball said, but I can feel the power of that man's hand on my shoulder. Well, we must never forget that Moody was not converted through mass evangelism, but by a one-to-one -one witness in a shoe store. I had a man come to me in the vestry at Westminster Chapel, and he said, uh, I believe I'm called to preach. I said, well, good. Join us Saturday out on the streets giving out tracts and talking to the lost. Oh, he said, uh, I can't do it. I can't talk to one other person, but I can preach to thousands. I said, if you're not willing to talk to one other person, you're not ready to preach to thousands. Here's the thing. D.L. Moody would end up preaching to thousands, but he was converted on a one-to-one -one basis. And the amazing thing about Moody was he never outgrew wanting to talk to one other person about Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you now, it's a lot easier to stand up here and talk to you than it is to go to the Boston airport tomorrow and talk to somebody I don't know and say, are you saved? Are you willing to be a soul winner? Because I think we honor D.L. Moody. And I've asked myself, how can I honor him without going over the top? We want to give the great honor to God. Well, his total schooling was the equivalent of a fifth grade education. He never went to college, never went to seminary. He was never ordained. Charles Spurgeon was never ordained. And Moody and Spurgeon became friends. Spurgeon said, here's why I'm not ordained. Their empty hands on my empty head will not add to my empty ministry. <laughs> At the age of 19, D.L. Moody moved to Chicago, where he had great success in selling shoes. He saved nearly $12,000. That's a lot of money. At that time, it's a lot of money today, if you ask me. He wanted to save $100,000, but he did be able to say that he had $12,000 and was debt free. He had boundless energy, natural shrewdness, and self-confidence. Uh, when he was 19, he established a mission Sunday school. When he was 24, he gave up business to work full-time in social and evangelistic work with, at the YMCA and his Sunday school. He recruited new students by offering them candy and free pony rides. <laughs> he taught the Bible lesson, knew each student by name. He sought financial contributions from rich evangelical businessmen. They saw he genuinely cared for the poor. He had been influenced by George Mueller's book called A Life of Trust. He began to read the Bible more and more and also developed a prayer life and prayed more and more. When I think of many preachers today, and I am sorry, but I happen to know this is true. There are many preachers who have not read the Bible through and only turn to the Bible when they need a sermon. And then there are some of you who have not read the Bible through. You know, there are two Greek words translate word. One is logos, the other is rhema. Now, these two words can be used interchangeably, 
Therefore, we don't want to push the distinction too far. But generally speaking, logos, word, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, refers to Jesus Christ, but also Holy Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Uh, did you know that this book I hold in my hands is the Holy Spirit's greatest product? I just wonder, is it possible there's anyone here who would like to get on good terms with the Holy Spirit? Would you like that, to get on really good terms with the Holy Spirit? Would you like some inside information? Get to know the book he wrote. He's very proud of it. Wouldn't change a word. <laughs> but you see, we're living in a day when there are those who want a rhema word. What's that? Well, word of knowledge, prophetic word. And I know major leaders who don't bother to read scripture, but they want a rhema word. And some of you are like that, I suspect, of quick word. You don't want to take the time to read four chapters a day for a year. That's what it takes to go through the Bible, four chapters a day. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones introduced me to his Bible reading plan. And I can say now I've read through the Bible 40 times, the New Testament 80 times, the Psalms 80 times. Some of you haven't read it once. Oh, you say, I want a rhema word. You know what, something right now. Should I uh, take this job? Should I turn left or right? Uh, should I go to the store today? Should I get married? Something real quick. It's like those who go to McDonald's or Burger King because they're in a hurry. Oh, by the way, I've got a rhema word for you. You ready for it? Here it is. Chase after a rhema word and you'll probably never get it. Seek God in his holy word and he'll give you a rhema word when you need it. D.L. Moody had a fifth grade education or the equivalent but then he was a man of one book. And look how God used him. Well, he had a prayer life. The average church leader in, a, in America prays four minutes a day. You wonder why the church is powerless. John Wesley prayed two hours a day. Martin Luther, two hours a day. In 1864, Moody expanded his mission into a church for immigrant families. He became president of the YMCA and became a popular speaker at the YMCA conventions and visited YMCAs in England. While he was in England, a moving story, he was seated on a platform and heard a British evangelist say, quote, the world has yet to see what God can do with one man totally resigned to him. D.O. Moody said, I propose to be that person. Let me ask you a question. How does it make you feel? The world has yet to see what God can do with one man totally resigned to him. Be careful before you say, I want to be that man. And let me tell you why. When Moody said that, the angels were eavesdropping. <laughs> and they looked at each other and they said, you think he means that? <laughs> Six weeks later, his house burned down. 
Six weeks after that, through the Chicago fire, his church burned down. You say you want to be totally resigned to God, he will want, he want to know, can you take it when things don't go right? Well, he became convinced, however, of a teaching that divided him and a lot of other Christians. I don't want to go into it except it's part of his life. He became convinced of the premillennial view of the second coming of Jesus. I used to believe that myself. I've changed. And I can understand why some believe it. It's easy to prove. And he became a friend of C.I. Schofield. And the Schofield Bible uh, became very popular in America. And the trouble with the Schofield Bible is people who don't know the difference will read the Bible and read Schofield's notes and think they're equally the Word of God. Well, they're not. Schofield would give his interpretation, and it caused many to believe in a particular way. Uh, my own view on this, and I didn't plan to say this, and I hope I'll be forgiven, uh, but I've got a book, I wouldn't have even thought of it, but somebody brought it by a while ago, just, they just bought it. It's, is your heart prepared for the midnight cry? You see, my view is, that the next thing to happen on God's calendar is not the second coming, but the awakening of the church just before the second coming. And that's what the midnight cry is. The word midnight does not mean 12 o'clock midnight. It comes from three Greek words, middle of night. It's when the church is in a deep sleep, as if in the middle of the night, expecting nothing. And then comes this awakening. And I know it's your heart's desire that a night like this could precipitate it. And you want to see it happen in New England again. Why not? But that's the next thing. And according to Moody's own view, uh, that's not likely to happen because things would just get worse and worse. So when you talk about a man, you want to extol them, but they're not all perfect. And if you disagree with me, uh, I have written a book also called Total Forgiveness, so it's okay. <laughs> In 1873, Moody went to England with his song leader, Ira Sankey. And in England to this day, when you mention Moody, you mention Sankey. Moody, Sankey, they were together, and they were very popular. And, and if you sing a song in England that has like four verses but one chorus, they'll call it a Sankey hymn. That's what they call it in England. It's a Sankey hymn. Very American, they think, but they like them. Some of them do. So while he was in London, he preached for the great Charles Spurgeon. Uh, here's a conversation. I hope this will make you smile. As he and Spurgeon were speaking, Smurge, Spurgeon was smoking his cigar. This may disillusion you with the great Charles Spurgeon, but he did. He smoked cigars. And D.L. Moody rebuked him. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen a picture of D.L. Moody, but he's not exactly Mr. Slim. <laughs> and so Spurgeon said, listen, Moody, there's nothing in the Bible against this, but there's a lot in the Bible against that. And he <laughs> pushed his finger into Moody's tummy. <laughs> I was hoping you'd smile at that. He returned to America in 1875 as an internationally famous evangelism. And it became a, a new style and began a new career for Moody in America. For the next few years, Moody conducted revival campaigns in large cities and small cities and actually uh, went to skating rinks and abandoned railroad depots as places to meet. 
No one had ever done anything like that before. During these years, he pioneered many techniques of evangelism. House-to-house -house canvases. When have you heard that being done lately? He enlisted the cooperation from all local churches and evangelical lay leaders, regardless of their denominational affiliation. This is a new thing, interdenominational cooperation, where you don't have to believe exactly the same way, but you can get on with each other. And so he also sought philanthropic support by the business community. He rented a large central building using a gospel soloist. This is another unprecedented thing, having a person sing before you preach. He started that. And he began the use of an inquiry room. Maybe the equivalent had been done before, but he called it that for those who would come forward under his preaching. These went in to an inquiry room. Well, sometimes Billy Graham is compared to Billy Sunday, but Billy Graham doesn't like it when they do that. He wants to be compared to D.L. Moody. Well, in 1862, he married Emma Revell, and they had three children. His brother-in-law, Fleming H. Revell, and Moody launched a publishing house. And Tom showed me on these premises, just half a mile from here, is the first Fleming Revell publishing house. Is Fleming Revell still a publishing house today? I don't know. I don't publish with them. But maybe I should, if they still exist. I don't know. But it's a famous publishing house. In 1880, Moody returned to his home in Northfield, and he shifted the main focus of his ministry to education, the request to be mentored and trained for Christian ministry became so common that Moody knew he could not ignore them. In 1886, he launched the Bible Work Institute of the Chicago Evangelistic uh, Evangelization Society, and it was renamed the Moody Bible Institute shortly before his death. In Northfield, he invited adults and college-age youths to the first of many Bible conferences at his home. So his ecumenical spirit and lack of theological training almost certainly kept him from rigid doctrinal positions. He invited preachers from diverse theological traditions to his summer conferences held right here as I speak. And I happen to know that G. Campbell Morgan who was one of my pre predecessors at Westminster Chapel, uh, got his international reputation as a Bible teacher by coming to this auditorium many times uh, uh, over 100 years ago. This changed his preaching style. Well, he had an interesting experience that... Uh, there were a couple eccentric ladies in his church who were always saying that we're praying for you, Mr. Moody, uh, implying that he needed more of something. And he would get annoyed with them. <laughs> and he would do his best. And as he would preach, these two ladies would look at each other and go, Sometime later, he was in Brooklyn. Amazing story. As he was walking in the street of Brooklyn, he wasn't in a church, he wasn't praying, 
He was just walking. Holy Spirit came down on him with such power that Moody said, I asked God to stay his hand. He said, I thought I would die right on the spot. After that, when he preached, the two old ladies looked at each other and said, <laughs> and Moody then confessed that he realized he did need more of God. And this is quite a concession to someone who's already been successful. You know, you can always tell a successful man, but you can't tell him much. <laughs> and when a person has already been successful, uh, he's usually not very teachable. But this is a great story in the life of D.L. Moody, and it is a, an, an account that Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones frequently quotes and refers to to support his own teaching of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Throughout his life, D.L. Moody emphasized, this one thing I do regarding God's call on his life and his life to work with souls. He also told his oldest son, Quote, almost everything I ever did in my life that was a success was done on impulse. I thought you might like to hear one or two or maybe two or three or more quotations from D.L. Moody. Some of these are very moving. If you can really make a man believe you love him, you have won him. Faith makes all things possible. Love makes all things easy. Character is what you are in the dark. The Bible will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the Bible. There are many of us that are willing to do great things for the Lord, but few of us are willing to do the little things. Like talking to one other person about Jesus. Let God have your life. He can do more with it than you can. We ought to see the face of God every morning before we see the face of men. That shows you something of his prayer life. A rule I have had for years is to treat the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal friend. He is not a creed, a mere doctrine, but it is he himself we have. The beginning of greatness is to be little. The increase of greatness is to be less. The perfection of greatness is to be nothing. The Christian on his knees sees more than the philosopher God sends no one away empty except those who are full of themselves. <laughs> Prayer is a serious thing. We may be taken at our words. I do not know anything that the world would... I, I do not know anything this world would wake up Chicago better than for every man and woman who loves him to begin to talk about him to their friends. Just to tell them what he's done for you. You have got a circle of friends. Go talk to them about him. 
If I take care of my character, my reputation will take care of me. When we know our Bible, then it is that God can use us. I cannot preach on hell unless I preach with tears. God never made a promise that was too good to be true. Small numbers make no difference to God. There is nothing small if God is in it. We may easily be big for God to use, but never too small. Well, I want to bring this to a close. What was the secret to D.L. Moody? Well, I will say it again. It was this. He was a personal soul winner. He had this position and passion that everybody needs to be saved. Do you believe that? Why do you think your neighbor should be a Christian? Or do you? Why do you think your loved ones should be saved? And so we're talking about a man basically uneducated and unpretentious. And it's just God's sense of humor that he would take somebody with a fifth grade education and let him reach millions. God used his personality as a salesman when it came to preaching. And the big thing is his baptism with the Holy Spirit. Without a doubt, that's what happened to him in Brooklyn. Now, I'm not going to allow this talk to be controversial. There are four interpretations of the baptism of the Spirit. All hell but good people. One, the Pentecostal view is you speak in tongues. Two, the Wesleyan view is its entire sanctification. Third, Martin Lloyd-Jones' view is the highest form of assurance. And fourth, D.L. Moody's view, if I understand it, is power for service. And so I'm hoping that there will be those who will want to come and pray and admit you haven't been a personal soul winner. And you're afraid to talk to people. God will give you power to do that. But before I come to that, I do need to ask this question. And you may feel just a little bit insulted that I would put this kind of question to you. Uh, but here goes. Do you know for sure that if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? Do you? Suppose you were to stand before God and he were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Suppose uh, as you came in, uh, you were given a sheet of paper. We, we, we might have done that, Tom. Give everybody a sheet of paper as they come in and... Um, you don't know why we've given it to you, but go along with me. You've got a sheet of paper now in your lap. Get out a pen. And I want you, in your mind right now, to answer the question. If you were to stand before God, and you will, and he were to ask you, he might. Why should I let you in? And there's only one answer, and you've got to get that answer right now. 
and you're going to be all by yourself. You've got nobody to coach you, no friend to whisper the answer. What would you say? Start writing in your mind right now, right now. If this were the real thing, I'm standing before God. He says, why should I let you in? There's only one answer. You've got to give it now. Had time to finish? Pass your sheets to the end of the row. We'll have people collect them. And now I've got a pile of sheets of paper here. Would you like to hear some of the answers? Here's one that says, I will believe I will go to heaven because I've lived a good life. So do you, I believe you, but you're lost. Here's another. I was baptized. Sorry, but you're lost. I was baptized by a Baptist preacher. <laughs> you, my friend, are lost as a goose. Here's another. I was brought up in a Christian home. That means you had a head start. But that won't save you. Here's a person. I've done my very best. I'm sorry. You're lost. Well, R.T., what more can you do than your best? You see, this is why I've written the book, Whatever Happened to the Gospel. I find wherever I go in the world, and in my old age, I travel the world, and I have this wherever I go, the people don't know for sure, and they don't know why God should let them in. And you know what you would have written. You know exactly what you would have written. And I have to tell you now, if you wrote anything other than Jesus died for me, for the equivalent, I'm trusting his blood. I'm trusting his death on the cross. I'm trusting him. I don't care who you are. If you wrote anything other than say, I'm trusting what he did for me on the cross. I wouldn't want to be in your shoes for anything in the world. But that can all change. Yes. That can all change. I can give you a prayer to pray right now. I think before I give you the prayer, I need to take two minutes because I've got a feeling somebody needs to hear this. For the person who says, I've done my best, and I say, you're lost, you say, well, that's not fair. Here's why. Your best will always come short of the glory of God. In order to get to heaven on your own steam, it means being perfect in thought, word, deed, 60 seconds a minute, 60 minutes an hour, 24 hours a day, every day of your life. That's what it takes to get to heaven. In that case, nobody gets in quite. That's why God sent his son into the world who fulfilled the law. And he was sinlessly perfect, 60 seconds a minute, 60 minutes an hour, 24 hours a day, every day of his life. And while he was on the cross, all our sins were transferred to Jesus. And God punished Jesus for what we did. And in that moment, the whole world was reconciled. And what he did is put to our credit on the condition that we transfer the hope that we had in our good works to what Jesus did for us on the cross. And you come to the place, I was saved by what he did. He's my substitute. Now that's the gospel. That's what Martin Luther rediscovered 500 years ago. And some of you have not seen this. It's not your fault. But now that you've heard it, I'm going to ask you a question. If you wrote the wrong answer 
in your mind a couple of minutes ago. I'm going to give you a prayer to pray. You don't need to say it out loud. If you want to, that's fine. But I'm going to give you the words to say. You know who you are. Just say this prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I want you. I'm sorry for my sins. Wash my sins away by your blood. I welcome your Holy Spirit into my heart. As best as I know how, I give you my life. That's it. Did you pray that prayer? I think, I think more than one prayed that prayer. If you prayed it, are you ashamed of it? Why do you ask, R.T.? Because Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. If you prayed that prayer, I bet you didn't expect this to happen tonight, and neither did I. I just felt led in the last 15 minutes. I'm supposed to do this. If you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you in 20 seconds from now to stand up. You say, in front of all these people, yes. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. I'm not going to ask you to make a speech, but if you prayed that prayer, five, four, three, two, one. I want you to stand up if you prayed that prayer. The ones that stood are the ones that had the guts to do it. Others of you out there wouldn't do it. Shame on you. Now, just before I finish, if you realize you've not been a soul winner and you're sorry, but you want to be, or if you have been, you want to be a better one, you realize it's not going to be in your own strength. You need the equivalent of what happened to D.L. Moody. In his case, he was just walking down the streets of Brooklyn. But what I'd like you to do is walk down this aisle and let people pray for you. And it just may be that God will empower you from this moment, from this moment, and you leave here changed. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. And if this is a word that you believe you need, I'm going to ask that the prayer ministry team be down front, and you that need a special touch of the Holy Spirit to be a soul winner, I'm going to ask you to leave your seat and come down to the front, and we'll pray with you. We're going to keep things open for ministry for a while here. This is a very holy moment. Um, so we're just going to take some time just to seek the Lord together.